Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, your humble reviewer. And today I'll be reviewing some recent classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. Uh, but before we begin the show, I do want to just do one thing real quick. I want to say a big thank you to everybody who sent me some birthday wishes. I, I know that you guys are probably well aware. This has been one really heck of a hard time of my life in the last few months, and it was really nice to get such an outpouring of everybody saying happy birthday and giving me well wishes, knowing that I have not been at my my best uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, and anything else you can put the Lee at the end of that, and L-Y, uh, because I've just been professionally crappy. Everything has just been horrible for me. I have not had fun for several months, and I'm a guy who lives to laugh. I love to laugh. I love to have fun. And life has not given me very many ha-has lately. And the, the the birthday stuff was a big thank you uh, coming back to you. It was a big, big gift for me. So thank you very much. Um, so with that being said, we're going to start the show in just one minute. I hope you enjoy. We've got a lot going on today. And I know I've been talking about it. I think next week I'm definitely doing the Naughty Podcast first. Then we'll do the Dungeon Special um, if I don't do something in between because i got so many books I've been trying to, to catch up on. So that's why I'm jamming some stuff in now like I have been. Um, and besides, I, I'm still working on growing out mustache. If you've ever seen my son, you know we grow hair, facial hair pretty quick. Um, but in this case... I do want to do something special for you all. Um, but again, I'm just so far backed up on books. I've got people that gave me books months ago. And of course, I've been pretty much down for two and a half months. And I'm usually a couple weeks behind to start with. So I'm really behind now. And I'm just trying to get caught up in this whole thing. So um, get ready. Get set. The show's about to start. Okay. So the first book I'm reviewing today is His Staff, Sci-Fi Lit RPG. Sci-Fi? There was some fantasy stuff in there, too, guys. Skeleton in space. Kind of like Muppets. Pigs in space! If you ever saw that, you know, it's great. Um, book one by Andrew... Andrew... Andrew Andres Laus. I'll never get it right, no matter how many times I hear it said. I'll not be able to produce it. So, so just forgive me. My knot does not work that way. Andres Laus. Laus. Um, with narration by Michael Kramer. See, I can do that. Michael Kramer. And that's only because I'm a Seinfeld fan. With a length of nine hours to the second. Douglas saw only stars. A band of brightness snaked its way across the sky, its muted shine surrounded by thousands of small lights that formed the rest of the firmament. Rise up! Rise up! Douglas rose. He stood, clods of dirt falling from his body as he righted himself in a jerky manner. He spotted other silhouettes in the gray darkness, but paid them no heed. The only person in the entire universe that mattered to him was directly ahead. Nothing and no one else was important. An old face with crumbling skin stretched across deep sockets and protruding cheekbones. Little more than a skull stared into Douglas's eyes for a mere moment. This man needed to be obeyed. That's all Douglas knew. That was all that mattered. You want the truth? You can handle the truth. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure you can. <laughs> I, silly me, had thought this was going to be a book for the up and soon coming, no pun intended, naughty special. Uh, I mean, here you have a skeleton popping bones, and the name of the book is His Staff. Double entendre, anybody? I don't know. Do you get the same thing? Were you thinking that like me? And the lady on the front cover, um, she sort of looks like someone from one of those other hair books out there. Um, I, can you look at her picture? I mean, just do you see the, the blow up? I mean, that's that's sexy. Yeah, it is. It's naughty. Um, so, so anyway, I kid. I totally kid. Um, <clears throat> I knew this was none of that stuff, but I just couldn't help myself. Like I said, I, I see it opening and I take it. Mm, I'm sorry, that's another joke for the naughty special. All right, so anyway, all jokes aside, um, my first impression of the book was that the first third of it felt a lot like a dungeon core building itself a dungeon. Uh, there's a lot of work that Douglas, the skelly in space, um, puts in to go from being a mindless skeleton to being an independent animate. Uh, 
try saying that real fast. Independent animate, okay? A lot of time is spent focusing on him learning how to regrow his body over and over again. And I had to feel, it kind of had to feel of like a dungeon growing its rooms as it, as it kind of got more powerful. Uh, because he basically rebuilds himself from the, the skull down, uh, starting at the mandible and going to vertebrae and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so I'm jumping ahead of myself. The story centers on poor Douglas, a skeleton who was raised from the dead by a vengeance-seeking necromancer. Uh, now, somehow, against all odds, how can I just let you walk away? Just let you leave without a trace when I'm standing here taking every breath with you. Ooh, you're the only one who really knew me at all. Sorry. Phil Collins uh, kind of interjected on me. Can't help it. Just be thankful it wasn't studio. So, again, against all odds, <clears throat> he survives. And he gets booted into another universe uh, that is pretty much sci-fi based rather than magic. Uh, there, the biggest problem sentient beings have is the Histaff virus. That is pretty much something that melts you into goo and then rebuilds you into an amalgamation of... Things consisting of yourself, your neighbors, animals, whatever is around. Uh, it makes it into a jelly, and then it takes your bones and does stuff with the bones. Um, so it's pretty gross and pretty cool. It's kind of like the thing and the blob mixed together in space. Um, so if you if you like the thing, like John Carpenter's thing, or the blob, I think 1988, the good remake, um, I think you would you would enjoy the Hisstaff virus. It's, it's pretty cool. Now, I, I don't know. My sons were saying something that's like Dead Space. Um, but I don't play Dead Space. I just I gave up after Resident Evil One horror, um, like the eighth Resident Evil stuff. Just horror games don't do it for me anymore. Resident Evil One, yeah, but other stuff, it just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Like I was trying to play Alien with my son, and you know you're hiding in this this locker and it comes trundling by, and, and I'm like, this just does not feel like one. It doesn't feel like Alien, and there's no agency here. You just can't do things. You have to. You have to hide rather than try to do something. It bored me. So I'm not real big on those things. Um, anyway, um, the, you know, the blob and the thing. Uh, and they pretty much wipe out any organic creature that exists. It might transform them into something or it might make them into like the blob or, you know, the amalgamations. But pretty much any living organism gets scoured by this thing. And, and this. so they quarantine any place that has this take place. Uh, now, Dougie Boy, or Douglas, as the skeleton's called, he soon makes a friend while he's on this, this I don't know if it's a station or if it's a floating spaceship, because I, I get the impression they're on a big vessel, but then they also have little vessels inside, and I'm not really clear on that. No, I mean, and by that, I mean, he literally, when I say he makes a friend, I mean, he literally makes a friend. There's a body, and he does some magic, and then there's a new person um, that will hang out with him. And they pretty much do everything they can to escape the station they're trapped on. Now, um, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of stuff that happens between then and the end of the book. Um, but basically, it's from that point forth, once he's got her, uh, it pretty much just goes from him leveling himself up in some capacity uh, or fighting or getting beaten up. So, you know, there, there's, there's not a lot of story in there other than him, like, figuring out his magic and how to apply his mana. And that's the majority of the book is really about that. So it's kind of like, um, like I say, dungeon building, because as it applies, like, if you've ever read, like, the Dakota Kraut Divine Dungeon, or, or even, you know, like, Jeffrey Falcon Logue's, um, dungeon books, you'll see that the dungeon, you know, um, Doc, for example, they, 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 figure out like what rooms work best and things like that. And he figures out, you know, how to, you know, grow his bones faster, what he can do to make himself stronger with uh, etchings and carvings and, and that sort of thing and putting mana into it. Um, and, and all of that, that's the whole book. That's really it. Um, this is one of those books where I say, um, this is a slice of life that doesn't go anywhere beyond the station. And it's not even, um, a station escape thing because really Douglas for most of the book has no clue what he's doing. 
He doesn't know he needs to get away. Um, and basically, everything he does is pretty much by accident. Um, really, Douglas has no agency for himself. I, I think he's kind of swept up by events. And he's swept up by either what his blue screens that pop up and tell him things do. And then he either gets smarter or dumber, depending on what happens. Uh, or he, he kind of has like the monster's attack. Or he finds out something and he, he learns to apply that information in different ways for periods of time. That's the story. So if you're looking for, and then this is like my only thing I say, here it is. I'm going to give you my, my disappointment with the book. Um, there's so much here where you have a fantasy skeleton, fantasy monster brought into a sci-fi world. There's so many possibilities here uh, that I was really hoping to see take place. Like, you know, the, the magic versus the, the, the sci-fi monsters, uh, magic versus the spaceships, the space shuttles, the space marines, anything like that at all. And, and you really don't have that because pretty much Douglas, and I don't know how to describe this any other way, he's like a one-shot kill or he is having his butt kicked. There's no in-between. Um, either he is crushed into powder or he is crushing the opponent. Uh, and the opponents give off like massive levels of XP. Uh, and he gets a lot of XP for doing crazy stuff like being the first to discover a continent and being the first to do this. And so, I mean, his XP, uh, that comes in is just off the charts, just so far above like what a regular, uh, character would, would see. Uh, but again, this is not a game. He came from one place into another, another world. And so he's applying the, the, the fantasy uh, stuff over the sci-fi stuff. And it, that's really cool and interesting, but I really wanted to see more of that and see how the sci-fi people dealt with it. Um, he has a companion, like I say, and she really doesn't help in that capacity because she does inform him of stuff, but it really isn't uh, to his betterment. I never see her helping him in some way that he says, ha ha, this would never have worked if it wasn't for her. Uh, he does figure out that she can help him by explaining like what a pilot is and that sort of thing. But beyond that, there's really not a lot of, of give and take between the two of them. Uh, I really did not like her character very much. She's very shrewish, very whiny, very bratty. Um, I don't know how to describe it any other way than that. I mean, and, and I'll get to it, but... Anyway, the pros. I'll give you the pros of the book. I like Douglas. He's not your typical MC. I mean, he's a skeleton. And, you know, I'm a horror guy. So you're talking monsters. I'm going to read a monster book any chance I get. Goblins, you know, goblins, goblins. Oh, and mimics, mimics. So, you know, I'll read that sort of stuff without question. And so give me a skeleton. That's right in my wheelhouse. I, I jump at the opportunity to read about a skeleton in space, uh, especially if it's a fantasy skeleton, because that's that's like Sinbad facing the dragon teeth warriors, you know, and, and that that never leaves my mind. Like if you if you had grown up with that, that stuff was like the coolest. Like you were always like, if you plant dragon's teeth, there'll be skeletal warriors that'll grow up, and those skeletal warriors are kick ass because they are they're cool, and that's what we have. We have this really cool, if not kind of obtuse skeleton uh, who kind of just survives not on his own. It's just by pure chance he survives. Fantasy world, he survives purely by accident. Uh, Sci-fi world, everything he does is, is kind of like, well, I figured this out and I can now employ this or it's by accident. So um, I get something new and I like that the sapient skeleton uh, pretty much gets by it on every chance by the skin of his teeth. Sorry, that's another pun. I know. Um, the magic system is different. Um, I like the options that are offered for races and classes. And it actually fits in live with Nevin Ilyev's Boxy, uh, who kind of goes from being a lesser mimic to a greater mimic to something bigger and better. And I don't want to spoil the story there for anybody who hasn't read it. But it, you definitely see, you definitely see the um, evolution of the monster as it goes. Now, his companion has something similar to happen to her, but not until later in the book, and I don't want to give away anything. But that is, is kind of cool. And in fact, the options that happen for her are exactly what I wish he had picked because the options come up, and I thought, well, 
oh man, there's there's a death knight and there's this and there's this. Oh, and this really sounds cool. He ought to do this, and he skips it because he's obtuse. He's very obtuse, and uh, she doesn't. She she nails it. It's like I would never have had any other thing to choose from. I'd have picked that right away. Um, and she actually has more options for some bizarre reason than he does. Um, but anyway, um, I, I just like he has some intriguing options. And I, I would just say that the Lesser Skelly we start with ain't the same guy we have at the end. So again, cool magic system. Lots of stats and character sheets and leveling. So you get your crunch in there. Um, I love the, the genre mashup of fantasy and sci-fi. I can see where some people be, would be confused. But I have read or played so many RPGs or novels um, that have mashups of different things like Torg. Um, if you've ever read any of the Torg novels, uh, which is where alternate realities come in and they combine, like, you know... Um, the cyber papacy, for example, it's a religious world that gets tainted by a cyber techno world. And so then it becomes your, your soul is electronic and so on and so forth. Really brilliant stuff. I mean, it's really slick, smart, and I, I miss it a lot. Um, and that's the same thing here. I, I, I was really looking for the mashup. So, you know, that's one of those things I really want them to explore in the future. I think it was under underutilized here. I think that there should have been more um, emphasis on his fantasy aspects and how he interacted with the science in that world rather than just how he's using magic, which is basically he's just etching things into certain things or applying like runes in his mind towards making magic happen um, and then having it occur. It wasn't like a melding of the two. It was just like him using magic against science. And again, it was really interesting, and I enjoyed it, but I think there's a lot more that could be done in the future with that. Okay, so the cons. And I hate to give cons, but I'm going to give you give you some of the stuff here. Um, a lot of the stuff in the book is repeated, uh, whether it's him healing himself or fighting. We always seem to go back to square one once it's all said and done with. Um, and again, like I said before, the XP for some of the monsters is crazy high. But I guess that's really needed in order for him to advance his leveling to the point where he does. Because if he doesn't, if he's not there grinding and making the book even bigger, uh, there's no way he's going to get the XP he's required to per the requirements of that level system. Now, they could have scaled it back, of course, but he still have to go out and do some killing and stuff like this. So with this, the his staff creatures really provide a lot of XP um, for their deaths. And... That is then applied to make him able to level up rapidly in one go each time he does it. Uh, but but again, it, it's just crazy high stuff. Um, so anyway, his his companion. Let me talk about her. I can't remember her name, um, and I don't even know if I want to. She has literally no redeeming qualities. I kept waiting for there to come apart where she kind of flips from being this whiny brat um, to actually being Douglas's friend. But no. No, no. And I get why, the ending, okay? I get why. But she was really grating. And without having that payoff, I really don't care much about her in either of the forms that she has uh, because she's got a whole bunch of stuff happening to her. And I, I just don't like her in any of the, the, the versions that we get of her, um, whether it's working with Douglas or, or not working with Douglas or being here or being there. There's a lot of stuff that she does I just did not care for because of her personality. Um, now, again, that might change in the second book. There might be something that comes up and we begin to like her more and more, but I don't think so. I think that we're going to see there's going to be issues with her for Douglas rather than benefits for Douglas. I could be wrong, but I didn't like her very much. And, but now, here is the biggest issue I had. And the other stuff is all kind of niggling, minor stuff. Um, this needed to have some epic feel to it. I just, I just felt like uh, we, we, we had all this buildup of something and no payoff at what's whatsoever at any point. Uh, the, the book just kind of goes from him learning this, learning that, learning this, learning that, learning this, learning that, and then the ending. And I don't want to give away what happens at the ending. But there's one thing that they were supposed to do, and that's it. And really, the, if you think about it, it was sort of like 
um, starship troopers where they're all at the base and are being attacked. Uh, the his staff creatures are attacking them. There should have been a lot more happening there than there was because it's just kind of like fireball, fireball, fireball. And it, it was not like I was going, oh my God, what are they going to do next? It was kind of like just very matter of fact. Uh, there was there was nothing epic. And that's what I needed. I needed some epic stuff to happen. I needed like a good punch. I needed something surprising to come out. Um, and it just seems to me that, like I said before, Douglas has no agency for himself in these stories whatsoever. This this book, he just kind of is a leaf on the wind. And if you've ever watched Firefly, then you know that that is not a good thing to be. Okay? Uh, Michael Kramer narrates this. And the dude has done something in the ballpark of like 75 fantasy and sci-fi novels, not counting a million other books. So I'm not even going to try and critique his work. I think he knows what he's doing and he does it well. I enjoyed listening to him, and I'm sure that you will too. Um, he's just one of those people you say, holy cow, how did they get him? How did they get that dude? Um, and I, I think that's the one thing I like about uh, Mountain Dale Press is they are not afraid to go out and get big names. They grab people. And, and they, they drag them in that you would not expect sometimes. You know, like I said, um, I, I was surprised to see Luke Daniels doing Advent, which n nothing wrong with that, but I just didn't expect that. And it was great to see it happen. And, you know, so on and so forth. So everything that they do, I mean, they're, they're really doing, they're going out of their way to do great, bigger, better things. And like I say, I enjoyed this book immensely. But I can see where some people would have issues with it because there is really no real path to the story other than Douglas goes from that world to this world and then he just kind of fumbles his way to the end. Um, but if you like, like, you know, it's almost a like crafting or dungeon building or something like that, that sort of stuff um, and leveling up over that and, and sussing out how to use a magic system, this is a really good book for you. I, I did enjoy it. And I think that uh, it's got a lot of, of things going for it. Like I say, my biggest issue is that the skeleton has no agency of his own. He does not um, have the ability to enact things for himself. So my final score is going to be 7.6 stars. And I thought about this a lot because I enjoyed the book, but I also thought I can't really go higher when there's a character who, the main character, in fact, who has no control over his own life, who kind of just kind of bumbles along. And if it was a joke or something like that, I, could, I would get it, and I would say, okay, this is meant to be, he's a bumbling, boneheaded skeleton that doesn't really know how to think. And that's not the impression I have from this. It was kind of like he was awakening. Uh, Douglas is awakening slowly, and he's, he's getting better over time, but he struggles from the time that he wakes up to the time that the end of the book comes. And that to me, is like a hard thing to say, yes, we, we really can pull this off. So best I can do is 7.6. Hopefully next time he has a little bit more um, wherewithal to go out and do things and, and fight the power uh, because we do need some big epic moments in this, this series uh, because if it's just the same thing next time, I just don't see you know where you could go with it. But I'm hoping... And I really do want to see the next book that they're going to do better um, and add some stuff that really needs added. It needs some actual grease. That's all. A little bit of greasing, and this thing will fly. It will fly right off the shelves, right off the wall, right down the street. It'll go wherever it wants to. So look out for it. Uh, but it's a 7.6 stars. Killing time. Time for you to go and get out of this world. Killing time. Put out the lights of everyone in this bar. Killing time. One last call for alcohol. So finish your whiskey or beer. Killing time. You don't have to go home, but you won't live if you stay here. So as you may have guessed, the next book to be reviewed is Killing Time, a novel of the realms by C.M. Carney, narrated by mind-blowing Armin Taylor with a five-hour and three-minute book length, and it's really a good length for this book. Seven and a half pairs of eyes turned towards the sing-song voice. It would have been eight pairs if my right eye wasn't swollen shut and my face planted in the mud. What I saw didn't bring me much hope. 
The voice had come from a small wood elf woman. She wore tight-fitting leather armor that was the deep green of a forest at dusk. Her blonde hair was close-cropped, heightening the point of her ears. Violet eyes eased back and forth as if she were assessing the men that moved to surround her. The hilts of two short swords protruded over her shoulders. As she stood there, one hip cocked and ready for action, she reminded me of the uh, pixie-like alt-rock singers currently all the rage back on Earth. I used Analyze on her. Analyze has failed. Hmm, not sure that bodes well. Move on, girly. This doesn't concern you, Garm said, shoulders tensing, legs eased into a combat-ready stance. It seemed he also sensed that this woman was more than some frail maiden. So, like, last time I reviewed a Carney novel, I was kind of hard on the humor part, and I stand by that. Um, it really kind of sort of felt forced, and it wasn't spot on like it should have been. I think the key to humor is not to try to make jokes, but have your characters put into situations that allow them to do funny things or make funny remarks. And I think the other way around last time, it was he wanted to make jokes and, and put that in there, and it just didn't work as well. Man, does Carney come through on the funny this time around. I enjoyed it a lot. I found myself chuckling, laughing, and snorting throughout the story. So this was a big plus for me. It felt natural and organic, and so it worked. But, but, this is not really, not really, a, a humorous story. I think it's a story that has humor to it. Um, it is it's kind of like a great tale sprinkled with funny, sprinkled with laughs, uh, that works so much better that way rather than being the laughs sprinkled with the story. Um, this short sort of focuses on the Banner NPC, if you remember the first novel, Lex, who was supposed to start out with the main MC, Griff, that's the main MC of the series, but he kind of got punted into a separate location in the first book like almost immediately after they met. It was like uh, they, they get there, and then the, the head god, that's not really nice, gets into a big old kerfuffle with Griff, and Lex gets the boot. Man, he is so far gone. He's out there so fast, and he, there's nothing he can do. He, he can't make it back there to get to Griff. So it turns out he's just been hanging out in this room, you know, in this, this little place for a while, and he's hanging out. So um, the story sort of happens to pick up um, right after he, he's kind of settled into the town that he's, he's been shunted to. Um, it turns out, really, that poor Lex has been living a Groundhog's Day scenario, uh, which is like a rinse wash repeat cycle or is it wash rinse repeat this is why my hair looks like this because i can never remember is it repeat rinse and wash or is it rinse and then wash i don't i can't i i don't know um anyway um sometime after he arrives in, in the end and he's he's in the middle of a card game so i know exactly what you're thinking i really do uh this sounds suspiciously like star trek the next generation's episode cause and effect Right there. That starts off with a poker game and ends up with the crew dying horribly over and over again. But at the end, if you remember, there's like this really awesome moment where Fraser from Cheers um, kind of shows up as the captain of the other vessel. And you're like, holy crap, that's Fraser from Cheers. And, and you know, and everything is happy because they break the time loop. Well, this is this is the Groundhog's Day scenario all over again. And, and this is one of those things that it either is really, really good, or it's really, really bad. Time loops are really hard to pull off. Um, you know, I bet, I bet you thought that I was going to reference like something like Happy Death Day, just because I'm a horror junkie. You know, actually, if I had to recommend a good time loop horror movie, uh, now that I think about it, I would tell you to check out Triangle. Triangle is really, really amazing. It does not take you places you expect. And you don't see a lot of the stuff coming. It's really smart. Smart film, amazingly well done. Um, you don't, you don't feel like it's, a, it's a cheap B movie at all. It really feels like it's a, a well thought out horror movie. It just blows my mind. But, um, I myself would never be able to, to recommend Happy Death Day. One, because it's PG-13. And horror is not meant to be PG-13. There's nothing scary about bloody stub toes or, 
you know, stuff like cutaway killings or it's not scary. It's like watching The Exorcist on the the three o'clock afternoon movie show on Saturday. They're not going to have anything in there. It's going to be all trimmed out, and this is it. So, um, and and then not only that, but the biggest reason I can't recommend Happy Death Day or just Death Day is because the lead actress looks like a fish through most of the film. Seriously, I'm just going to just throw this up for a second. Look at all these pictures where her mouth is open like she's gasping for air. This is terrifying. I mean, look, I mean, what, what's up? Does she ever close her mouth? Ever? I'm sure like that she swallows bugs and spiders all the time. She has to. Anyway, I digress. Uh, and that is pretty much where the similarities stop, okay? And I, I don't mean that, you know, the main character Lex runs around with his mouth open. Um, but, you know, it is the Groundhog Day-esque type thing. Um, and it's, it's even different from Feedback Loop. And, and I, and I have to say, like, that's one of my favorite books. Um, and, and Feedback Loop stands alone just as much as this. This really does a really good job. And the reason why I cite cause and effect is because cause and effect, um, showed you different sections of the loop over and over and over again with different perspectives so that you didn't feel like you were just watching the same thing happen over and over again for, for the hour of the show. It was, it was completely new each time you saw it, even though you knew what was going to happen, you were always pleasantly surprised to get some new information. And, and that's what Carney does here. He, he sets you up he, and maybe the first two or three times you get the same over and over kind of stuff. And then he begins to break away. And he, he, he chunks off into different areas of the inn and the events that occur and so on and so forth. And it keeps your attention, even though you pretty much know what's happening or going to happen from start to finish, but from the time that, um, he, he finishes his alcohol and goes to make his bet to the time he dies. And in fact, Carney pretty much swiftly, swiftly and wisely um, makes it where he just kind of offhandly says, and then I drown. And that's it. Because you know what happens. You know what, you know, you don't have to have the whole thing replayed a thousand times, a thousand times. He, he does this really, really smartly. Now, um, another thing, um, that I have to say is he checks off a lot of the dots to fill in the gap with the main series. Uh, so he kind of tells, a side tale, but moves the main story along in addition. Uh, and that's the best part of all this. It's kind of like two birds with one stone, so to speak. And Corny really effectively uses time travel. I mean, in a, in a wise move, he manages to allow Lex to keep up with Griff level-wise, uh, because there's no way um, him being stuck in some little brinky-dink backwater town that he's ever going to be able to catch up to Lex, I mean, not to Lex, but to Griff, when he finds him, because he's just going to be like this dude who's been hanging out in some little scrub water town, and he's not really leveled up or done anything. That would have been an imbalance. And he demonstrates some pretty cool cheats to keep um, Lex in the game through this time loop, as well as displaying the disadvantages, all the while keeping you interested. Uh, so th there's a lot that happens here that's really, really smartly done. I really give Carney a lot of credit because I know this could not have been easy. Time travel is one of those things you really have to think about over and over and over and over again in order to not screw it up. Um, and yeah, I mean, I did see the ending, what was going to happen there, but it was fine. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good for figuring out what's going to happen at the end of a novel if there's clues given. Um, and yes, that was what happens. The only time I ever, ever said... Uh, I think he's stretching things here as there were parts where he talked to like eight people in the, in the inn, um, all before his nemesis arrives, uh, to kill him. And usually he only has like 10 to 15 minutes. And I would be hard pressed to say that you can convince one person to do the things that they do within two minutes or less. You know, so even if he's got eight people or five people or whatever, it would really be hard to do. It would be a really difficult thing to do, but I, I give him the consideration and say it is possible. I suspend my disbelief. But that was like the only thing I had to say that um, time-wise uh, with the loop, it didn't really kind of fit because there were just points where either he never had time to do anything or it seemed like he had all the time in the world while he was in this bar to get things accomplished. 
So, you know, that was like the only negative to the whole story as far as I was concerned. Plus, the narration performed by Armin Taylor, seriously, he's one of my favorite narrators. And and he manages to keep from sounding too much like his work over in VGO. Although there was one guy that does kind of sound like Cutter a little bit. Uh, It was a small character and it wasn't overly pronounced. I just kind of said, oh, there's Cutter. Cutter's slipping in. Uh, But he simply nailed this book. He nailed it. I love everything he does and because he does it with such style and energy. Final score, 8.3 stars. It keeps the main story in its crosshairs, but stands alone quite well. Seriously, you could pick this book up and read it without knowing anything that has come or gone before it, and you will be totally fine. And that is not easy to do. I respect that a lot, just as much, because it could be a standalone book, you know, from start to finish. You just pick it up and go, oh, hey, here's what happened. This guy got separated from his pal. He's stuck here in his time loop, and so on and so forth. And it works. It works really, really well. Um, in fact, you don't even need to read the main series at all to enjoy this book. I do recommend it because I, I love the main series. Uh, it's a great homage to like things like D&D um, with its, its monsters and stuff like that. And I love the dungeon crawl in the first book. Like You expect this to be this big sweeping epic thing, and it's nothing but a dungeon crawl. Seriously. And it was so good. So good. Carney really, really goes out of his way to to make things happen here. And like I say, it's got just the right amount of funny. It's got just a totally great amount of action. Uh, and, and it makes sense. And that's the hard thing to do with time travel. If you're going to do a time loop, you better be right on the money every single time you write a scene and not screw something up. And I didn't catch anything. Now you may, but audio wise, it's kind of hard for me to catch stuff because I'm just listening along. Whereas if I was reading it, I could catch it really simply. But I didn't catch any flubs or or faux pas at all here. I mean, there's no mistakes whatsoever. He just, he just did a great job on this book. The next book. (laughs) The next book. And I haven't been drinking. Just so you know, this is me finally feeling alive and alert and happy. Um, I really feel like today is probably one of the first days and I really feel whole and hearty and hale. Um, So I'm going to be a little goofy and silly. Uh, I tried last time, but it just didn't come out so good. In fact, I was told I looked tired and worn out and uh, did not seem to be at my best physically. Um, so I'm hoping now you can see that I'm, I'm actually doing pretty good. Anyway, the next book is Dan the Destroyer by Hondo Jinx, narrated by the lovely Andrea Parsnow, with a book length of 9 hours and 29 minutes. Dew beaded on the ruins of Fire Ridge like sweat upon a dying man. The smell was awful. We crushed Roderick's raiders, Dan thought, entering the main courtyard. But now their corpses are launching a counterattack on our noses. Disease would follow. That's why Dan was getting his people out of here today. At least the survivors. Nearly a hundred brave elves had died defending their home. Now they lay, their deep red skin glistening in oil, atop three tiers of the pyramidal wooden pyre constructed at the center of the courtyard. At the apex of the pyre sat not a body, but a pile of black cigars. These symbolized the red elves' departed matriarch, Ahanina, who had flashed out of existence shortly after Dan's wedding to her beautiful, bubblehead granddaughter and the Red Elf's new matriarch, Thelia. Holy hellfire, is it time for another Dan the Barbarian book? <laughs> well, you lucky devils, it most certainly is. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yep, I threw in an extra whoop just because I could, and there was no extra cost to you whatsoever. So, first... I need to say that I'm a huge fan of this series, okay? I mean, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, Hondo has kind of really captured a feel that I appreciate. Um, his writing and humor are spot on. The battles are bloody. The sex is hot and heavy. And I debated putting this book in my naughty special. There's a lot of stuff in it that really applies there, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but I decided against it because while it does have its naughty bits, there's a lot more going on besides that. Um, and so I appreciate that, you know, as best I can. Um, and, and so I'm not just going to put this into the naughty special, even though it's got sex. Um, and Hondo is a genius when it comes to maiming, mayhem, monsters, and magic. 
Dan's story is an epic tale that is condensed into sweet little segments of fun. Um, and this is what I love the best about the series. It's just the pure fun. Uh, Jinx writes from the heart, and he he does not have, I don't know how to put this, um, like me, I'm dark. I have I have a lot of dark issues, so if I write, the uh, writing is going to be very dark and grim and moody. It's kind of like Batman with his antidepressants wear off, uh, and he finds out that Robin died, and, you know, um, Ace the Bat Dog got hit by a car, and he finds out Alfred's really his dad, and, you know, it's all that. That's that's kind of like my mindset where I'm at when I write, and that's the characters and stuff I do. Hondo Jinx, no. Hondo is like, man, what the hell would be fun here? What would be like the best thing? It's kind of like Errol Flynn movies, but Jackie Chan mentality. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, sweeping, epic, swashbuckling, but goofiness still involved. And that is so amazingly brilliant. I love it. Um, and this is what I love about the series. It's just, it's, like I said, it's just pure fun. Just pure fun. I get a tingle every time I think of starting a new chapter, i.e. novel. Uh, it, you know, because Dan is such a well-rounded, likable character um, who does the best he can in any given moment. I never feel like he's scheming or plotting. Or he, I mean, Dan is just pretty much, he, he's one of these guys that reacts and reacts hard. Um, I guess that's a bad way to put it, considering I was thinking about putting this in the naughty special. Um, but, but he reacts more than he plans. And so it leaves a lot of room for things that Jinx can throw at him and have him, you know, and, and like respond in crazy, insane ways. Um, now, I have to say, with all that being said, there is one moment, there's one where like the book kind of jumps the shark, you know, Fonzie leaping the shark. Um, and it comes off when Dan squares off against a, a giant purple worm. Nice inclusion, by the way. You don't see giant purple worms very often. Uh, and that is only because I know the audience, and we have all seen somebody pull a Joan in the Will movie numerous times in the past with different monsters. Um, so I, I'm going to let it go because it was just, it's a one-time thing. But seriously, I, I really am getting tired of people you know, letting themselves get swallowed so that they can kill the big monster from the inside. That is a trope I don't need to see anytime soon ever again. Um, unless um, what you really have is there's this giant purple worm and his entire esophagus is filled with rotating chainsaw-like blades that just chop up the food that it swallows into little microgram chunks, less smaller than the size of a pea by the time it gets to its stomach. Uh, which is a wash with this acid that is so strong that it would melt you within three seconds of having it touch your flesh. Um, that would be funny. I would love to see something like that happen. You know, like, I will stop this giant dragon or this giant worm by leaping inside, having it swallow me, and then I will kill it from the inside out. And then, ah! and the only thing that comes out the other end is fertilizer. That I would appreciate. Uh, but again, that, that's like my only bit, and I don't mean to spoil a section or a scene, but I mean, you'll see it coming from 100 miles away. Um, and so I don't think really I'm spoiling anything for anybody. Um, you know, eh, it's there. Um, but anyway, still the harem building and continued exploration of the land is engrossing. Um, you know, he keeps moving on and doing things. Um, and at this point, by the end of the book, Dan has so many ladies, I don't even know how he finds the time to take care of them. Even if he does have the stamina. I mean, you know, five ladies, and that's, that's even if you do two a day by the end of the week. You know. Um, anyway, I do want to ask Hondo, and if you're listening, Hondo, please respond below or let me know on Facebook or something. Um, the, the main villain, uh, he... Did you take his name and deliberately make it sound like Robber Baron? Because that's all I could think of after he, he said his name was, this is the homage from the old term. It was an homage, an homage, not an omelette de fromage, but an homage um, to the old Robber Barons. Because every time he said his name, that's what I thought of. And it really kind of fits. I mean, it's, it's exactly what he is. Um, and why the big bad is the guy who has some giants blood him. 
giant's blood in him, and, and he is meaner than Leroy Brown with a toothache. Um, and, and that's why, because he, he's just, he's that tough, he's that, that nasty, he's that crotchety, he's that mean. He's also a crafty SOB who knows how to outwit Dan every time Dan tries to deal with him. Uh, the dude is crafty like ice is cold. Yeah, see, and I'm not going to do Beastie Boys. I'm stopping myself right there. I'm cutting it off. Um, I'm trying not to sing any more today, but that dude is crafty like ice is cold. Yeah, so Beastie Boys. Um, but Dan, Dan is not so much crafty. No, I, I think I, I termed somebody else as being obtuse earlier. Ah, and Dan is pretty obtuse sometimes. I mean, you would say, oh, no, he shouldn't be. But he is. He's very obtuse. Um, but then barbarians aren't really known for being a genius. Uh, and Dan repeatedly shows this in his dealings with this old man, this old half quarter drop of blood giant, whatever he is. Um, he gets outsmarted at every turn. Um, <sighs> plus, you know, I mean, uh, I just have to say, the story, it really just gets bigger and better with each novel. Jinx, I'm totally jealous because this is so good. I, I don't know how to put it any other way. I, I, I think that you know how to scale things, but I'm really kind of shocked. Like By the end of the, this book, I can't even tell you how many women Dan has on my finger. I can't even count and literally keep track of, of what ladies he has and who they are and all that. I mean, I would be, like, totally lost. I don't think Dan could. I, I really don't. Um, but, hey, you know what? Let me just ask you this. What makes Dan the Barbarian so good if it's not the writing? I mean, it is the writing. But if it wasn't for the writing, what would make this an amazing book? Andrea Parsnow. Andrea Parsnow's narration. That might be a huge factor. It plays into this. like. Mario Lemieux plays hockey. Yeah. I'm not going to do Gretzky. Screw Gretzky. Lemieux. I'm a Pittsburgh guy. Anyway, I have to give Parsnow credit. You see Parsnow and Ice, that kind of goes, you know. Um, anyway, she has to voice something along the lines in this book of like 30 different women, plus Dan, other male warriors, and the old half giant coot. And it never feels like she repeats herself. I mean, not ever. Never does she repeat herself. And I think that her, her Robert Barron impersonation is an impersonation if she's making the voice up. I don't think so. Um, anyway, her Robert Barron um, performance is, is just incredible. I love the guy. She made it so funny. I mean, I was, you know, you could tell when he was being, you know, goofy, but with an undertone of danger and, and a hint of malice and things like that. Like, she, like, I give Andrea so much credit because. She really knows, like I say this all the time, she infuses emotions, but really, I mean, that's an undersell because she, she layers stuff. She, she, she layers, you know, tombra and timber and, and you know, different, j just different quivers of her voice with each character. Um, so that like, you can tell when, like, for example, like the, 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 the giant guy is now giving a warning. Or when he's giving a threat. Or when he's just trying to be friendly. Um, but with a hint of, I'm being friendly to kind of fill things out. Uh, she really, really does it so amazingly well. Um, and, and I have to say, she makes the sex scenes, sex scenes steam and the battles bleed. I mean, you know, she she really, honestly, she's amazing here. And I, and I think, you know, like her Robert Barron voice is worth 20 grand. Because it's pure gold, pretty babies. Pure gold. I don't think I've ever heard narr uh, Andrea narrate a bad book. Um, she is top shelf. And I, I need to, to get an extendable ladder just to get to her library of awesome works. That's how, how top shelf she is. Uh, thankfully, I can just listen to her on my phone. I just pick this bad boy up. And bam, I got all my stories right there. Anyway. Um, yeah, so I can listen to her anytime I need to. Really, she's top shelf. And, I mean, she just, just narrates the hell out of these books. And I think that you can really get the sense of fun that she has in the Dan the Barbarian series in comparison to other series that she's read. And I'm not trying to say that she doesn't make them all fun, but you can tell that she knows this book is more about the 
uh, a high flying, you know, epicness of, of goofiness that this is, as opposed to like this has to be serious. Like if I listen to her new remnant, totally different style. And and again, that is another one of her strengths. It is so powerful um, that she can do that. That she can say, hey, hey, um, I can do this, that, the other thing. Things you didn't know about, things you've never been told about, and I can show you a few things on the side. I mean, she really does just nail the narration. And, I, and I, again, she's the one that made me realize um, that ladies can narrate men. Um, and, and again, you know, so now I listen to people like Annalise Rene, um, where I wouldn't have. I would never have done that if it wasn't for Andrea, uh, you know, um, Annie Ellicott, and, and, and so on and so forth. Those ladies, you know, Lori Catherine Winkle, they they really, really have skills and talents, but I would have never done it because honestly, I listened to Kathy Bates um read an, an audiobook, and it was so bad. It was so bad. I'm like, how can an Academy Award winning actress screw up the narration of a book this bad? I listen to Will Wheaton read books, and that's all he does. He just reads the books. I mean, if you want to hear Will Wheaton's voice, fine. Spend 20 grand an hour and get Will Wheaton to read your book for you. It is going to sound like Wesley Crusher. And what did Picard say to Wesley? Shut up, Wesley. That's right. If Picard can tell Wesley to shut up, I sure as hell don't want him narrating the book for me. So you can get these big famous people or you can get somebody that really knows what the hell they're doing. And that's where I go back to, like, the old, old Disney movies before they started adding in, like, you know, um, big-name actors into their, their stuff. Um, you, you would have people that you, you would never know who they were. You'd never see them on the street and go, oh, hey, I know that person. Um, and that's why I like voice actors so much, like, for cartoons and things. I know a lot of the voice actors, and I really, really follow them along um, because they do such incredible things with their voices. Uh, that's why I like Jeff Hayes, because he has such a range and such an intense amount of things he can do with his voice. And Andrea is the same way. Um, when she can pull off a guy, and I'm not thinking, as I'm listening to her talk about, you know, talk as Dan, or talk as the robber baron, or whatever, I don't ever sit there and think, geez, this is pretty good, but it just sounds like a woman doing the voice. I never have said that, ever, with Andrea. Uh, Andy is just, she's killer, and so she takes this up to another notch, which is great, because Dan is an awesome book, um, and no matter what the title is, it's just Dan the Barbarian to me, and it's an awesome series, and I, I love it, I mean, it's just incredible, and it's because she helps bring it to where it needs to be, so my final score, 8.4 stars, amazing series, fantastic narration, which is a true collaboration between the author and narrator. All right, next book, Quest Accepted, XP Unlocked, book one, by J.S. Grolke, narrated by Kieran Flitton, with a book length of 9 hours and 16 minutes. Wind whistled softly as it wove through the plentiful evergreens. Not knowing which way was best, Evan trusted his instincts and turned left. Huge snow-capped evergreen trees flanked him. It was beautiful, and would have been peaceful, except that he wasn't exactly sure what to do next. Feeling anxious and uncomfortable, he continued walking. He was used to games telling him what to do, where to go, and how to proceed. So far, this game was nothing like that. It was pretty much a figure it out or you're going to get hurt type of game. Pulled out of his thoughts, Evan noticed something peculiar in the distance. A small figure was riding what appeared to be a lion? Its large mane shimmered as it walked, and it was headed his way. Wow, I need to get me one of those, he thought, quickly realizing that this too could kill him. So he started looking for a weapon. Hey, pretty babies. Here we finally go with a book that has a strong YA, young adult vibe. Uh, now, as a father of this many, five, I have to say that the best sell for me for a book is for a book or series to be something I can listen to with my kids in the car or 
in the house or wherever it is, wherever I'm going, whatever I'm doing, if I can listen to the book and don't have to worry about um, stray vulgarities or movies flying out or, you know, whatever. I mean, I, honestly, I don't care about vulgarities and I, I could care less about beheadings appearing, but my wife has issues with that sort of stuff. And yes, it is kind of gross and nasty that I say um, the boobs flying out is probably my biggest concern. And sex is not a horrible thing in life, but that's just how I was raised. I, I think that um, I'm okay with you know people getting chopped up and diced and sliced and people swearing, but if you talk about something that's about the body and it's not it's not appropriate, so um, I like that I can do that with. A book, okay? Um, it's really important to me to have something I can play for the entire family. Now, I don't feel like every book should be a YA book, but having that as an option, it does a couple things for me. It lets me get my kids hooked into, you know, the lit RPG stuff. Um, you know, Prop Guy, he, he has listened to, you know, s several hundred, I don't know, however many books I've listened to. Um, but he's usually there for most of them. At some point, he listens to bits and pieces. And, like, you know, I think the, the last book that I listened to with him around was um, Richard, uh, was, was it, oh, was it Richard Hummel, I, I think? Um, but anyway, uh, he was really intrigued, and it, it made him want to find out uh, more about the book. Uh, and, and I don't get that a lot. You know, if I, I take a book out, I, can, I think the only books my kids really like to listen to are like the Monster Hunter books uh, by Larry Correa or the Tom Stranger books by Larry Correa or the Strange Magic books, you know, the hard-boiled stuff by Larry Correa. Um, yeah, I, yeah, you get the idea. Um, they're, they're Larry Correa fans, but his stuff is pretty much written right in the wheelhouse because it's just about... Bad guys shooting up bad guys. You know, not bad guys, but good guys shooting up bad guys. Um, there's not a lot of sex. You know, if it is sex, it's only just tangently touched upon. Um, and there's a lot of action and superpowers and things like that. So those books are perfect for them. I, and I don't consider them young adult books. But I don't have a problem with my, my eight and my five-year-old listening to those books. Anyway, this is something that will keep my kids occupied. Just so I don't have to talk to them. Yeah, I mean, that's like my whole goal in life is to get through life without actually finding out my kids' names or what they like, what they don't like, uh, at least until they're 30. And maybe then they'll be interesting enough for me to talk to. Uh, but I doubt it. I mean, I'm still waiting for my dad to talk to me. And he, you know, he has a phone and he knows my number. And we don't talk. And it's the best thing ever. Um, so, uh, you know, like anyway, I'm just kidding around. Uh I think it's important to have books like this to allow me to bring in my kids and enjoy the, the genre. And it's something we can all listen to safely. And I just want to thank Grolke for that. Uh, there are a few books out there that we can all enjoy. Secondly, even though this is a YA book, it is important to note that it does not talk down to the adults who should be listening. Um, this is a story that is easily stated to be fun for all ages. You know, it's like the circus. Fun for all ages. Come on inside and see the man eating chicken. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, Kieran Flitton narrates and does a pretty decent job. But for some reason, his reading to me didn't seem to flow like I would expect it. So I'm going to kind of start there with, with my critiquing. Um, and I'm just going to kind of blow this totally out of proportion, I'm sure, uh, and make it sound worse than what it is. But his reading almost comes across like he is reading the book one sentence at a time. Um, and then I'm not trying to say it like harsh, but I'll say it like this. Each sentence, you, if you listen to it, sounds like an island unto itself. There is an exact half pause between each line and sort of feels mechanical rather than organic. I'm not saying the narration is horrible uh, or list unlistenable, but... It is definitely standing out to me as a listener, and it took away from my enjoyment. I noticed it throughout the book. And if you caught those pauses, and I'm, I'm probably not the person to read, but I'll go back and do that again. Um, you know, each sentence, see, I have too many commas and stuff like that, so it doesn't doesn't pause the way I want to, but every sentence he does that with, it's, it's almost like he says, okay, this is a perfect sentence, clip, and puts the next sentence in there, and it had to be 
if he did it that way, it's got to be painstakingly done. Um, but it, 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 he, he reads it well. I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't. Or he has all the stuff you would want to have in there. But it just seems like there's too much of a pause between the sentences because there's just times I'm like, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Is that it? And it's not the case. And I don't know if I'm expecting it, but I was listening um, to a couple other books right after I listened to this. And I, I, I literally sat down and said, okay, I'm going to try and kind of figure out like where the, the pause between sentences go for length. And they were a lot shorter as far as I could tell. Uh, it, it wasn't like, yeah, if you're looking for it, it wasn't like it was like this big long pause. It was kind of like this. And, you know, so it was like bump, bump, rather than bump, 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 you know, with a, with a beat or rhythm to it. And, and so to me, um, I'm, and I'm not saying that this was a horrible or unlistenable event. Um, I just noticed it. And, and again, I, I don't want to say I have great ears or anything, but there are things that I do pick up. And, and Flitton is a fairly new narrator. Um, and it might just be him trying to put out the best damn product he can. And I appreciate that. I mean, he only has, I think, like two other books out besides this one on Audible at the moment. Um, so, you know, he, he, I, I, I appreciate that he's trying to put some attention into what he's doing. Um, but otherwise, I think he did a really good job. I mean, he, he plays the girl and the boy very well. Um, and they, they do come off as being teens and their concerns do feel like teen concerns uh, as opposed to adult concerns. And I know that's going to sound crazy. Uh, unless you're an adult, and I mean, like, you know, in your 30s, 40s, something like that. Um, but he, he plays it off pretty well. I think he did a good job otherwise, but it was just that one thing. And again, it, it's a hiccup. It's not a pothole. It's just a hiccup. Um, but again, I, I just wanted to point that out because if he is new, I wanted to realize, you know, don't leave like this much of a gap. Just trim it back a little bit and keep the story flowing um, as you go. Now, a little bit more for the downside stuff. The story is Slice of Life. And, you know, I've been working on that, getting over it and all that. But uh, um, And it's also a trap in the game tale. And I just wish there was a bit more focus of the MCs getting things done rather than rambling around. I know if I was trapped in the game, I would be focused. I mean, like, laser focused. I would be, like, just um, on escaping. I mean, there would be no question as to what the hell I was doing. Secondly, some folks might feel the crunch is a little bit off. There are um, things to support the late RPG stuff, and that's all I need. I just need to have a little bit to show me that this is a lit game or a lit book. I don't have to have tons and tons of stats scrolling across my page so that you know I have this huge book. It's like 10,000 pages of stats and, and character sheets and stuff like I don't need all that <clears throat> I need a little bit here or there just to confirm that I'm in a game or that actually I'm not in the game the characters are in the game and that you know this is how life is and this is what happens past that I'm good but there are some people that will take umbrage I love that word umbrage uh, they will take umbrage at, I'm just horrible with this um, umbrage with the lack of really crunchy, crunchy bits. Um, for example, I don't think, and I'm just saying, I'm trying to remember this, I don't think I ever heard them take damage or receive notifications for damage. Um, you know, like, boop, we just lost five health points or something like that. I don't think that ever came up. And I think that was just kind of keep things going and keep things PG. Because, you know, if you said, like, oh, you know, the 12 points off and the guy lost an eye, well, that's not very PG at this point. And I don't believe you can have a family-friendly book spouting every gory detail of wounds being given and gotten. So I kind of overlooked that tale. But I want to put it out there for you guys. Because there are going to be people that go, this is just not what I expected. And and again, I'm really, really forgiving with certain things. Um, and, and stats and crunchiness, I'm okay with, like I say, just give me a little bit and I'm good to roll. Um, I know other people, they need a lot more than that. Um, so I'm just putting it out there for people to realize. It has another stuff for me to know that they're in a game and influence the environment. And, you know, they get other notifications. So my real problem is that the characters don't to choose their own classes and so on. It's already done for them. That is kind of like, again, I like the characters to have agency and have control over themselves. So you top that with a trapped in the game thing and it, could be dicey if it were me playing that game, for instance. I would not be happy. 
um, you know, being told that I got to be a dwarf and that I'm a, a minor. Uh, I don't want to be a dwarf and minor. I, I don't know. I don't want to do that at all. You know, I, I want to be a necromancer, right? All right. And, and I want to be a badass necromancer. So if I can, I'm going to be like a doppelganger necromancer because they're super tough and scary and they're, they're cool and they can infiltrate. I have things I want to be, damn it. I don't want to have things chosen for me. I, I really don't. Um, and that's one of those things that that did kind of stick in my craw as it happened because I would have been really irritated. But again, that's the story. And so I have to go with it. Um, but that was an issue for me. That was my issue. And it was more of a personal issue than it was a professional book issue. On the upside, I do believe that Grawky does an amazing job in portraying a teenager of each gender. And that can't be easy at his age, as in not close to being a teen anymore. Um, they were really well defined and expertly described. Uh, their actions really feel genuine and like something a teenager would do. Uh, in other words, they were believable. Not unbelievable. Oh, the things you say. You're unbelievable. Oh, sorry. EMF flashback. That happens to me periodically. Um, anyway, there were some nice twists and turns that the story takes, and there is a setup for a sequel that works pretty well. Personally, I enjoy the kids and how they dealt with their situation. I think Grokey hit his target audience like a guided missile. Uh, next road trip, I will listen to this with my kids. Even though I've heard it once, I'll be happy to listen to them once more just to like get the kids into this world and hopefully they'll really enjoy it and we can go on to the next book when it comes out. Um, and I have teens and under 10s and I think my teens will feel the ADD issues and my unders will readily confirm that grown-ups do everything in their power to ruin their lives. Final score is going to be 7.5 stars. The story has a lot of potential to it in future books. It just seemed a bit predictable in the end, and it was a slice-of-life story. Uh, and the odd tick in the narration, I mean, I had to pull a little bit off for that um, here and there. But otherwise, it's a good listen. It's fun for the family. I look forward to more. I really do. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens next. Uh, so again, I, I think there's some things that could get improved a little bit, give the kids, you know, something more to do than just kind of wander about and, and do the slice of life things, give them goals to hit and get through and complete things. And that might work a little bit better for me. Um, but there are people that like slice of life. And again, I guess I'm trying so hard to look past it, uh, the issues that I have with slice of life. And sometimes I can, and sometimes I have a hard time. And it just depends on where I'm at during the day that I read that book. And and again, Slice of Life is no problem, but it just it, it needed a little bit more. A little bit more focus on something. Okay, so 7.5 stars. Ha ha. The next book is Sentence to Troll by S.L. Rowland. Rowland, Rowland. Rowland, 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 Rowland. Got to keep them puppies rolling. Rawhide. Right. Anyway, narrated by Eric Martin, with a book length of 9 hours and 28 minutes. Why me? I lean against the hard back of the chair. Even if my parents did manage to call in a favor to someone, this is next-level technology. There are 24 pods, maybe a few more I haven't seen. How am I being punished, but also lucky enough to be able to test out the next wave of gaming at the same time? There have to be people who would volunteer, no questions asked, for this type of experience. The simple answer is that we wanted a gamer in the mix, says the beautiful brunette, who still hasn't told me her name. Someone to test the boundaries of our creation. We knew from the get-go that your case would be found guilty. Not that many gamers wind up in prison. So, what, am I not actually being rehabilitated? I mean, I'm perfectly fine playing a game for a month with no consequences. What I really want to know, though, is why prisoners? She leans forward and flashes me a dangerous smile. Oh, everything the judge said is true. You will most certainly experience what it feels like to be attacked, to be bullied, to be persecuted for simply being what you are. We have embedded a deep history in Isle of Mythos, and trolls are hated like no other. So, I'm going to scare you all. 
this book is not your average lit RPG novel. While it is fun and full of fights and magic, and there's also something more. Um, it is a very rare book because this book makes you think, my pretty babies. Think, think, think. It makes you think and dream because I don't mean that in a bad way, but I want to let you know, I actually discussed this with, with Mr. SL himself. And I never asked for, nor did I receive an answer on this. Why? Why? On account of the fact, I want to draw my own conclusions. And I'm not even going to tell you what I think the book is about. Um, so, so what am I talking about? What is there to think about? What is so deep? What is so like the ocean trench, the Marianas trench? Trench is, well, the MC is a gamer. Uh, and he's a gamer with a couple of strikes against him for saying negative things to other players. Like, you know, you, you suck so bad, you should go kill yourself. Um, and that last offense lands him in court where he is handed some jail time for, oh, I don't know, let's call it hate speech or, or detrimental thought stuff or wrong think or whatever you want to put it as. Um, he ends up being in court for just saying something. Just saying something. So, I don't know, but it was like something that went against community standards. So think of like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and any other social media that have policies violated just by talking. Just by saying something, you can be cut off, put in jail, Facebook-wise, um, completely cut out com altogether. Um, that is what happens here. And in, in this scenario, in this, this timeline, uh, you are not able to just say what you think. You can't just talk to people the way you want to um, because there are rules and regulations against making people feel bad or to institute, or in this case, like I would say instigate like suicide or suicidal thoughts or depression. And to me, it was a really powerful thing, just all into itself in the very beginning of the book because, you know, Steve kind of, he, he just laid this out and said, this is a potential thing that can happen. He doesn't say whether he's for it. He doesn't say whether he's against it. He just kind of puts it out there and says, this is where things can go. This can happen at some point in the future. And so he takes that premise and he kind of runs with it like a madman. Uh, what happens is the MC is sentenced to like spend, you know, 30 days in a game where he learns what it's like to have to deal with people like himself, you know, people that, that, that he's going to be somebody that no one likes and that they, they berate him on every chance they get. Now, of course, it's not just berating. It's also beating and killing and stabbing and all that sort of stuff. So the point is here is I can't tell if Roland is, is for or against his policies. He has never let his thoughts and feelings lean the story one way or another. And that's, that's pretty good. He, he just sort of says, this is where we can go. Not if he likes the direction that it's going in or he hates it. Uh, and that's smart because he allows the audience to draw their own conclusions. And the rest of the book sort of rolls around the subject of racism and even genocide. Okay. Uh, again, I can look at this and say, this is a metaphor for race relations in the U S or even an allegory for something like, Israel and its position in the Mideast. There's a lot of things I could say this transposes over here and, and it works if I slot this in just as well as it works if I slot this in. Um, it's really slick. It's really smart. And again, he doesn't beat you over the head with it. Now, here comes the tricky part. Ready? None of it's overt. Like I say, none of it. You can glean it. Yep, you can glean it. But there's also this overlaying fun story on top, on top of all that, which means you're free to ignore all the other stuff. If you're not looking to think or, you know, go into some deep philosophical issue, don't. You don't have to. Because the story itself, I mean, that stuff is there. But if you aren't into it, don't, by any means, attempt to go into it. Just enjoy the story for what it's worth. That's it. A guy that's made to become a troll. And trolls aren't liked where he's going. And he kind of has to try to save the trolls. 
That's the story into itself. It's just that's all the story is really about. But there's underpinnings, undertones. It's a book that I say it, it makes me draw my own conclusions, and I like that a lot. Now, I'm not getting a message from either side of the political spectrum. It's not layered on so thick that you're going to feel like you're reading Melville's Billy Budd and getting beaten over the head with like a Christian imagery. You know, was Billy Budd really symbolically being you know crucified? No, you don't have that crap. It's not there. It's not some hoity-toity kind of stuff. He's just laying stuff out, and, and you take it wherever you want to go to. You got the pieces. You can build your Lego set the way every, whatever way you want to. Now, the MC, whose name is Chad or Chod, not Chode, uh, is forced to play as a troll, a loathsome, unlike race, that is slowly being hunted to extinction in the world he goes to. Chod then does everything he can to save the trolls in his 30-day window of playtime. Because he's only supposed to be there for a certain amount of time. And this is a book, oh, excuse me, I have to say I enjoyed from start to finish. I, I like the characters and the setting, uh, the adversary. I'm trying not to say bad guy so much or villain. It's just right and proper. So I'm going to say the adversary. But I really mean is the a-hole who really outdoes Chad in the troll department. Uh, he's just a total D-bag. Um, that is, as an internet troll and not a racial troll like Chad, um, he's just really just a jerk. And he belongs in prison. Chad ends up being pretty clever and not just a mouthpiece by spotting how great a gamer he is. I mean, he tells you, I'm a great gamer, and the reason why we lose is because you guys don't know how to step up your game. Well, he proves it. He proves he's got mad skills with a Z. Like the kids say nowadays, skillies, skills. Anyway, um, I love following his exploits. I don't say that very often about stuff. Um, Eric Martin comes in swinging like a madman and makes like Babe Ruth pointing out where he wants the ball to go. Over there. Um, he's done a few other lit RPG books like Way of the Clan and Adventures on Brad, so he's no newbie. And I enjoyed him a lot. I thought he was a good fit for Roland's material. Um, he just really knows how to, to apply things. Uh, like I say, he, he keeps the, the main story, but there's also the underbelly that he, he kind of just kind of rubs and makes the leg kick and scratch as he's going because he's the one that really feeds you the little subtleties as the story progresses. He has a wide selection of voices and paces the story quite well. But, again, I think the whole story really just kind of hinges on Chod doing what he needs to do, and you are kind of pulled along for fun. Like, when they go out and, you know, he's he's supposed to go out and kill all these little baby dragons to get away or whatever you want to call them, worms or whatever, and then he can't do that uh, for reasons um, it's funny and it's it's realistic. It's realistic because that's how life is. You get thrown curveballs. Uh, you know, for what should have been a simple quest, go out and kill 25 of these things and come back. We'll give you this and you're done. That gets blown out of the water just because people have other ideas than what the quest says should be done. So um, I think the, the writing is pretty smart. Um, and well, I know it's pretty smart because it made me think a lot. Um, and I still think about this book. And I, I probably read it, you know, I, before I went to the hospital. I've been meaning to get this book is one of the books I've been meaning to get to so long. I mean, it's he's already got book two out. I mean, come on. I'm just getting to book one. But I mean, this is one of those books that's been out and it, it is just fun and exciting. And I really think that it has an audience because I know it's doing really well. And I and I I know it has an audience for a reason. I enjoyed this book all the way around. I liked the little uh, empty gremlin kind of guy that he hung, hung out with, and, and kind of made friends with. And I liked the, the couple of the other the trolls. And I, I like how the first thing he did was was try to be like I don't want to spoil it, but I'll just put it like he, he sees players and he's kind of like screw it. I'm going to go over and introduce myself. And things don't work out so well. It was a really good moment for the book. So it's got a lot of things like that in the book spread throughout. It's not just one section or one second of story. There's a plethora. And yes, Hefe, I know what a plethora is. Mm -hmm. um, 
It has a plethora of humorous events in conjunction with the action and the fighting and the villains and such. So I'm going to just say, get this book. It's really fun and thought-provoking. 8.2 stars. I really, I I loved it a lot. And like I say, if it makes me think, I have to, to really just give an applause because I, I don't get that very often with a lot of books. Even great books um, by great authors don't make me think like this sometimes. And it's, it's kind of, it was kind of like reminiscent of like, like Rod Sterling telling one of his tales on Twilight Zone. This was a Twilight Zone tale to me. And if you know me, that's high praise. Uh, like I say, I'm a horror guy. And, you know, I grew up watching Outer Limits and Twilight Zone and Rod Serling always had these awesome twists. And this is one of those things where the guy goes into the game to learn a lesson. And he, he learns a lesson that he, I don't think he was supposed to mean to. Uh, because there's things that happen in, in, at the end of the book. I don't even think he wants to go, you know. Uh so I, I think it, it's it's very Serling esque in, in its production and its presentation, and th- that is incredibly well done for me. So eight point two stars. Hey kids, what time is it? It's Sabu Spotlight time! Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo! That's right, Sabu Spotlight today is brought to you by the letters N. Y and C. What? Monster Hunt NYC? That's what I'm reviewing right now! Written by Harmon Cooper, narrated by Jeff Hayes and Annie. Super hot Ellicott. Uh oh, did I just say that? I'm sorry. I should save that for the naughty special. Um, anyway, book length of 7 hours and 53 minutes. With a blade easily the size of a surfboard, I looked at it uneasily as we shook hands. I'm Chase. This is my, um, first time. She rolled her eyes. Is that the way you normally talk to a lady? Because if so, it will always be your first time. I chuckled at this, snapping out of my momentary surprise. (laughs) Yeah, no, I just... I don't really know what I'm doing. My friend Iris gave me this code, I activated it, and here I am. As Aya let go of my hand, a wave of green energy traced over her body. The words bonded appeared over her head, and I suddenly felt a closeness to her that reminded me, of all things, of the closeness I felt to Iris when we played music together. We bonded? I asked. You are my new alpha, and I'm your new huntress. I would have preferred someone with a little more skin in the game, but I guess you'll do. So here's my full disclosure. I do that a lot sometimes, I think. Um, I got an advanced copy of this book when I was in the hospital dying. No joke. Uh, And it really helped me get through the suffering I was going through. This is not an audio book like you've ever encountered before. Uh, And this, it it is just a testament. This book is just a testament to the greatness of Harmon Cooper's brilliant writing and Sound Booth Theater's incredible talents. SBT completely reinterprets and reinvents what you think an audible experience should be. Now, I say that because this is not an audio book. It's an audible experience. Uh, I, now, you know, I'm a huge fan of Cooper's writing style. I mean, I just get Harmon Cooper. Uh, his humor, his wit, his intense action scenes, his proclivity towards snark. And, well, just about everything he does on his computer word program. No other author, and I mean none, with the exception of Terry Pratchett, has ever made me laugh so loud, so hard, and so frequently as Cooper does. Uh, he can weave a story like he was using one of Fate's looms. You know what I mean? Like, this guy is just up there, whoop, 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 and they, like eight people die uh, because he just told the, you know the book to go do this. He's scary. Monster Hunter is, again, a part of his shared universe. And I love that fact too. I mean, he goes out of his way way to tell separate and complete stories, but keeps them all in a sandbox with which you're familiar. And, you know, some authors really don't like to do that. They like to keep everything separated. Um, William Rand doesn't. He, he keeps everything all in one place. I love that about him. It's a shared 
multiverse, if you would. Uh, all the stories have a cohesive thread, even though they're told in different places. If it's really considered to be a different place, I don't know. Um, but it's the same thing with Harmon Cooper. Um, Harmon Cooper, even if it's just a reflexively out of left field, you know, um, just whisper of Proxima Galaxy or Unigaya or something like that coming up in one of his books, they come up. And that might be it. You might just be like, okay, yep, they acknowledge it. You know, there is a Proxima Galaxy stuff going on. Or there's Unigaya. Whatever it is, um, he he keeps it all together. And that's just, it's just awesome because I love shared universes. Uh, it's just a fun thing. And I wish we had that with like the lit RPG community. I wish we could get a bunch of authors together, create one universe that any of us could get into and tell a story from. And, you know, I, mean, I think that would be just brilliant. Um, but Cooper has his own little playground that you are invited to come to anytime. Uh, you know, Mr. Rogers used to say, yeah, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. This is the neighborhood that you want to go to. Um, NYC is such a top-notch classic. Uh, Cooper has expertly crafted it, and it will keep you on the edge of your seat. And I don't want to make it sound less than what it is, but it really has overtones of, like, Pokemon and the fact that they go out and they hunt down monsters and capture them, um, hence the monster hunt in the title. It's not the Larry Korea monster hunters. Um, but like I say, uh, it, it just... <sighs> There's just so much going on in the story. The characters, as always, are amazing, and they're fun, and they're interesting. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed every second of listening to this. And I'm going to tell you, I waited a long time. One year I waited for this book to come out. Yep, I remember Jeff making the announcement they were getting started. And then, one year later, then... And only then do we see traction. And then the book comes out. The book finally comes out one year after it all goes to press. And so, you know, it, it it's had me on the edge of my seat waiting for this book to just pop. Because I knew, I, I mean, I, I listened to, to, to Jeff and Annie um, doing the little figuring out stuff and, and that sort of stuff on our, on our YouTube pages. And... I said, this is something special. There's something amazing about to happen with this book. There's going to be like nothing that's come before it. And I really, really was right. I hate to say that. I was right. I was 100% right on this spot on. Dippity dog. I knew what I was talking about because this book is going to blow your socks off. Um, and, you know, I should have prop guys just like throw socks up at this point. But he is just in a grouchy mood lately, and I can't get him to do anything with me if it's that teenage stuff. Um, and he's got a girlfriend from Sweden, and so he really does not work with me much anymore. Uh, but if I had a girlfriend from Sweden, I don't think I'd be working with my dad either. Um, but anyway, yeah, that'd be where the socks would pop up if it come up to the point. Anyway, uh, what SBT does is something that is altogether different and new. Uh, they have managed to escalate the medium of audiobooks. And don't ask me how. Don't ask me how. Because this is something more than just a theater of the mind. Um, most audiobooks, that's how, that's how I think about it. They're a theater of the mind. You, you close your eyes and you listen. And they say, you know, um, they went to the to the bar and there was drinks. And then the guy pulled a gun. And the gun, you know, go, and, and something happens. And they go out. And, and so you see it all in your mind's eye. So it's a theater in your mind. And I'm not going to do Miss Saigon. I know everybody's here thinking, probably after everything I've done today, you know, I was going to start singing the movie in my mind. And I could have. I could have. But I was I'm being good here. I want to focus on sound booth. But I do want to sing the movie in my mind now. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, sound booth has molded an entire experience that I doubt. I doubt you'll ever have touched upon in your lifetimes from an audiobook. SBT blends the spoken word with catchy tunes and songs throughout the book. And I don't mean that you get some music at the start of a chapter. And this is kind of like um, when I re re reviewed I Am Gamer by Gabriel Rathweg. What I really wish they could have done was, was he had a soundtrack set aside for every chapter. I wish we could have had that play. I mean, I know you can't do it. But had that soundtrack play for each chapter, that would have been amazing. Would have just been amazing. 
here we get that, but this is original stuff. Um, so, you know, this is a fully fleshed, functional, original music that it has, it's just the heart of the book. I mean, it has the heart of the book. It, it, it beats all on its own, uh, but it's a complete and utter life unto itself as well. There's a spirit that it, it, it just kind of fills into the body of the work. Uh, you know, so this is, this is a melding. It's not just, just Harmon Cooper's book here. This is SBT's work as well. I mean, this is totally a collaboration 100% down the line. I mean, there's no question as to, um, if who anybody owns it, because I don't think either Cooper or SBT really owns this book anymore. It is a life unto itself. Um, just to tell you, I mean, just to put it like this, I can completely hear um, some of the acid jazz influences in Jeff's work. Uh, and Andy, Annie, Annie, sorry, I'm getting stuffy. <laughs> okay, that's better. Annie carries a haunting noirish vibe at times. It resonates the tones of the hipsters in the 40s and 50s with the modern sensibilities of today. I mean, it's really neat. There's, It's not like a single genre of music. They really kind of mix and match and blend and like I say, you know, with his staff, uh, you got your sci-fi and your fantasy worlds colliding. Here, it's a it's a mishmash of different styles and, and, and thoughts and music. They, it's kind of like postmodern jukebox, if you've ever heard anything of them, um, which is incredible. But again, it's not. It's something altogether new and different because it's a totally different kind of sound. And, and again, these are all original. And I would really like to see, like, like Sound Booth just put, like, some stuff on YouTube of all their original music, just so I can <clears throat> listen to it while I'm driving in the car. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, now, my only regret, the only regret I have in this whole freaking book is that they didn't include Justin Thomas James to come in and jam as well, because the man is a master musician himself. I mean, he can he can keyboard it up, baby. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, James, the man is a magician. Yeah, magician, because he's got magic fingers, okay? Um, now, I heard one reviewer say, and I won't say who it is, that this was all Annie here. And again, I'm not trying to take away from Harmon Cooper. He wrote the book. Um, but again, this is such an experience. I've got to focus on Sound Booth for a little bit. Um, but somebody said it was all about Annie, you know, and, and Annie's singing was great in her persona. And I have to admit, she is amazing. Her singing is perfect. Uh, it is a personification of the ladies like, that she plays. They're both intense and involving and moving. But I have to give Jeff his due, just because. Jeff holds his own against the incredible Annie Ellicott. I mean, and that's not easy, because I, I don't think, you know, most people can. Um, he gives his heart and soul to this production. You can tell he went over and above, gave three pints of blood, and performs 150% capacity on this project. There are labors of love and passion projects. And then, for Jeff, there is the Monster Hunter NYC. I mean, seriously. There is dedication to a project, and then there is the gusto. Gusto? Gusto. Displayed by Annie Wilkes of Stephen King's Misery. And that's kind of where we're at. I'm not sure where Jeff lies on the spectrum, but wherever the needle falls, it's going to be indicative of his heart and soul being contained in the body of this work. Annie is, as I say, is so killer in these parts, you will be dripping blood when you're done listening. And I don't care what you think, she will happy have you bopping along to whatever. Da, 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 da. I can't even do it. Um, that she lays down. I mean, this is why I didn't sing Miss Cycle on the movie in my mind, because just talking about this book shows me just how weak and feeble my vocal cords are when it comes to singing. I do not have it. I do not. Not in comparison to them, and not to her especially. On a side note, I do want to say that my favorite song uh, was the one that was inspired by City of Angels. Uh, with Nick Cage and Meg Ryan way back in the 90s. Um, and, it, and it goes from with the Nick Cage um, line, which is kind of shared with Dennis Franz's character in the movie as well, um, Mr. Uh, Messenger. Um, but they say, I can't see you, but I know you're there, which is referencing um, the, the MC's friend who knows that there are the monster hunters there, but she can't see them, but she knows they're there. Um and it's it's just awesome sauce over ranch fries cooked in duck fat. I love that song. Uh, so 
take it for what it's worth. It needs to be extended. In fact, I'm going to ask Jeff Hayes and Annie Ellicott to do extended versions of these songs. And, and like I say, put them out there for us to enjoy. Uh, because it was, just, it, was just, it was just so fun. Uh, and, you know, da-da-da-da-da, da 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 You know, just, it's just so snappy and bappy and boppy. And it just it sucks you right in. Um, the story, the voice work, the music. It's a strange magic. I mean, it is. It, it, that will only be imitated later in the future. From this point forth, anything that comes out like this is just going to be pure imitation. Because these guys have captured lightning in a bottle. I mean, this is... Or is it? Is it uh, words on recording tape or something? Or is it electronically digitally downloaded? Whatever it is, they really have captured it. Um, this is not just an audiobook. It is not just theater of the mind. This is a freaking rock opera concert on Broadway by all the greatest singers. Okay, you don't want to miss it. Final score, and I'm going to just say this right up. My high score ever is always going to be like nine is the premiere for me. It's nine. Nine stars! Because I don't really go higher than that. I really can't. If I have, I have fooled myself. Because this is incredible. Like I say, this is, this is kind of like the first time you saw Terminator 2 with all the special effects that you've never seen before. It's just like that. It is incredible. It's intense. Um, it's it's like Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell, meets Terminator 2. Uh, it's just crazy amazing. And you can't understand where they got this stuff from uh, because they, they just mushed, oh, they just mushed everything together so well. And, and, and like I say, this has got a soul unto itself. Uh, Monster Hunter NYC is just fantastic. Well, everybody... I'm so sad to say this, but it's time to go. Time to go. It's closing time. Closing time. You don't have to you know, go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for supporting us and watching. And I totally appreciate everybody who takes a moment to watch and listen. Uh, and if you listen, I hate to do like some of the stuff that I do where I show pictures and stuff like that. You're missing out. Um, but it's just me. It's, it's how I work and operate. And, and I can't describe everything as we go through it. But um, catch the show on YouTube at some point in the future. Uh, but if you want to support us, because we need supporting, uh, <clears throat> I need a man's ear, I think, from Seinfeld um, for support. But if, if you like, you can like the little RPG podcast facebook page or the youtube page or just share and like the video uh i really sincerely hope that you have enjoyed the show uh please as always leave comments in the section below here and feel free to tell me whatever you like i enjoy the feedback remember you can always follow us on facebook twitter youtube itunes google play and stitcher um so unless i get banned for some reason you can find me there i'm really hoping not to get banned but I'd like to say thank you again. Take care. And remember, keep listening. <laughs>